Um, what is green chemistry? It's a philosophy of achieving safer and more sustainable chemistry. Why do we need green chemistry? Well, we live on a small object floating in space. Uh, it's a fairly thin atmosphere, and uh, there's always concerns about water and supplies and things like that. And it's become an increasingly populous world. Um, that number, I can't implant it, but that number increases uh, every few fractions of a second. Um, and by 2050, there'll be 9 billion people on the planet. Uh, that's a combination of, of, there's still a number of births occurring, but also people are living longer. So the number of, pop, of people on the planet gets on to carry on more and more. Um, around about 9 billion, it'll probably level off, but we've got a period of time where we've got to make the planet sustainable. Okay, there's also the concern about wealth disparity. Um, the average American earns about $60,000 per annum. Uh, if you go to the Democratic Republic of Congo, that's about $800 per capita. And the people obviously in the Democratic Republic of Congo want to live like everything they see coming out of Hollywood. Um, so everybody wants to earn more and have more goods and things like that. So not only do we have to reduce the footprint as it is now, but also compensate for the wealth development of the rest of the people across the planet. So that's the trick we've got to survive, we've got to solve that one. All right, and every time that chemistry has done something in the past to make the world better, often we've created some other problems. Um, DDT, which was supposed to wipe out malaria, turned out to be dangerous to most life forms. Uh, acid rain from our factories is, was causing lots of problems in the past. That's been to a large extent solved. Leaded petrol caused, uh, neuro, had neurotoxic problems. Um, the ozone hole started spreading across uh, the planet and that had to be dealt with. Those have been largely dealt with, but there's bee colony collapse, which may be being caused by chemicals in part. Ocean plastic is in the news a lot at the moment. And of course, climate change. So we have to deal with these. Okay, carbon dioxide emissions, um, we have to keep within two degrees at least, um, otherwise we have climate change, and chemical production is one of the major producers of CO2. Okay, and not only that, you can't always see the climate change occurring immediately, but if you go to Beijing, you will notice that uh, during certain times of the year, the the, uh, it looks even worse than Johannesburg does. <laughs> okay, and in fact, uh, for the Olympics, they had to shut down all the industry for a while uh, to, to clear up the atmosphere. Okay, so at the moment, we've got an unsustainable linear economy. I think there's a, a parallel session talking about these things. Non-renewable resources, manufacture, we use and dispose of it. I'm gonna talk about the e-factor in a minute, but we are very inefficient in what we make and then we throw most of it into landfills. Okay, that's, that's non-sustainable. Eventually the resources will run out. So we need a circular economy. We need to be able to make things that we can recover, disassemble and, and separate and put back together again. We need to depend mostly on renewable starting materials. We need to reduce our waste in production and we need to recycle everything else that we can't disassemble. Oh, sorry, we do have to dis disassemble and put it back together again. Okay, so that brings us down to uh, green chemistry. Um, Paul Anastas and Warner put together a list of guidelines or titles you can put everything underneath. Um, John Warner couldn't make it that day. He set up a company in the US and that company is, he's actually implementing the stuff that he talks about. So Paul goes around the planet talking about it and getting up enthusiasm and John's actually doing it. He's set up a company that does that. Okay, so instead of looking at that long list, I'm gonna break it down into three areas. One of which is safety. 
inherently safe for chemistry, safe for solvents and auxiliaries, uh, less hazardous chemicals, designed for safer chemicals, I'll talk about those. Uh, obviously for industry, even more important, efficiency, waste prevention, atom economy, reducing derivatives, catalysis, energy efficiency, and real time analysis. And then the last bit is gonna be important as well, renewable feedstocks designed for degradation. Okay, and why is it called green chemistry? It's because it's profitable. <laughs> Okay. Every time you fix, every time you fix up a process and make it more efficient, you're going to make some savings. So everybody's worried about oh, green chemistry. We can't afford it. That's nonsense. Everybody who's managed to put it in place has made savings on it. Okay. So uh, less hazardous chemical. I'll go through them as quickly as I can. Less hazardous chemical synthesis. Um, so basically, you, we need to shift over to which chemicals can we put into a, into a process which aren't going to be hazards in the first place. Uh, obviously, this is going to help out on insurance. Okay. Um, and some of the things you can look at here, if you use nitrogen gas in a process, it's got a, uh, a hazard value of about zero. You, you put out sodium chloride. Yeah, you don't want to do that too much, but it's not too bad. Carbon dioxide, even though it's a greenhouse gas, in small quantities, not bad. Acids and bases become a bigger problem. By the time you get down to heavy metals and that, you're putting stuff into the environment you don't want. So we need to find chemical reactions that don't require those things in the first place. Um, this was one here as an example of the vulcanization of rubber, which is used in tires. Originally, it was a three-step process. It involved chlorine, which is obviously a toxic gas. You don't want it in your process if you can avoid it. And Monsanto came up with a process much shorter. It just uses oxygen, atmospheric oxygen, and a catalyst. And the byproduct here is just water. Okay, so you've, you've already eliminated a whole load of toxins from your process. It's quite easily done, and uh, they managed to make a number of benefits from that as well. Okay, the second one we're going to talk about inherently safer chemistry. This is a picture of China, a place in China um, about a year or so ago. I think about 170 people died in that explosion. Completely leveled uh, a massive factory. Um, there's a whole load of chemistry that is dangerous and those can often be replaced by other, other processes. Um, so for instance, uh, oxidation, azuridations, hydrogenations, chlorinations, epoxidations as well you can get explosions. So we need to find out ways of replacing those with different types of reactions. Um, and also there's different kinds of um, ways of dealing with these processes. We can go from having large single reactors to actually having uh, continual flow chemistry. Uh, there's a couple of universities that, um, University of Pretoria um, and uh, Nelson Mandela University in South Africa are kind of specializing in those. These become a lot less dangerous. You can do a lot of them in parallel, but each one by itself is really small. This one is a bit smaller than average, but you can take each reaction and do it continuously in a small box and get vast amounts of product out the other end and scale up. Instead of making it bigger and bigger and having a whole bunch of engineering problems, you just put another one next to it and another one next to that and another one next to that. And it really makes manufacturing a lot simpler. Uh, maybe I'll give answers a bit later. <laughs> So chlorination, the other things you could do with, instead of chlorination is you can use, say, things like sunlight. Obviously, it kills off things um, in, in wastewater. Uh, you can use peroxides as well and things like that. But uh, um, I won't talk about any particular industry at the moment. So in the next, the next session, we can talk about the state of things there. OK. Um, the other thing is the, the products themselves should be as uh, harmless as possible. Uh, one of the things we're seeing at the moment is a lot of compounds appear to be endocrine disrupting uh, compounds. Uh, recently they've been saying, well, it's affecting our health. Uh, there's even the suggestion that it's bringing, early, bringing on early onset uh, puberty. So the idea is to eliminate as many of these as possible and replace them with new, with new chemicals. Okay. 
Um, and here's, I think, where we get to the, the, the bit which would be most interested, interesting for most industry is prevention. How do, we, how do we prevent the waste? It's better to prevent it than to clean it up afterwards. Okay, so leftover parts, just proof you've made it better. Uh, if you've put together IKEA furniture or rebuilt an engine, you, you, you may want to say that, but it's not true in chemistry. Okay, so anything left over after what you've done is a complete waste. Um, so the, the person who um, came up with the, the figure around that as an environmental impact factor is Roger Sheldon. He works with us at, at WITS. Um, the higher the E factor, the more waste there is. You want to get down to an E factor of zero. So E factor is the mass of, of material you make for every uh, kilogram of product. And if you've got a really efficient system, that should be basically um, one or zero. You want to get, to get it down to zero. Um, and this could be applied to any industry, not even just chemical industry, but any kind of industry whatsoever. You can use this, this figure to work that out. Okay, um, so this was the original thing, was having a look at that. Bulk chemical industry is quite wasteful, and as you get to more complicated molecules, pharmaceutical industry, a massive waste there. For every time you build something, you have to keep on adding bits and taking bits off. That was really bad. Okay, so uh, in the pharmaceutical industry, E factor can reach 50 or 100. Uh, applying green chemistry principles has the potential to cut this factor by five, by five or ten times. Okay, and you also want examples. For Pfizer, has reduced E factor for Viagra from 108 down to 8. That was what was possible through that. So, knowing it's green, it means that we don't have to be embarrassed about taking Viagra anymore. <laughs> okay. Uh, and the pharmaceutical industry, in a fairly short time, managed to take go down within basically a decade, has managed to cut down the amount of solvent they use in their processes. So in the last talk, they're saying, well, we have to cut down our carbon emissions. This kind of thing allows that to happen. Okay, how do you cut down the waste? Well, one of the things is something called atom economy. And this is where you need the chemists involved um, because they will advise you how to, how to get reactions to get there. Atom economy is basically just a balance. It's like if you put in this number of atoms into a reaction, how many do you get out and how many are you pouring down the drain? And by using clever chemistry, you can get, uh, in some cases, 100% atom economy. That means that nothing is wasted. So that's it's the, it's the balance of the two things together. Okay, so this was uh, an exam early example. A chlorohydrin process, making chlorohydrin, here it is. An early process, you had to put in chlorine, uh, water, and a whole bunch of, you had to put in calcium, and the atom economy, so what you got, what you got out of it, you got 28% of, of the molar number of atoms out. Okay, a new process with a catalyst and hydrogen peroxide, which has only got water as a waste product, 76% of it. Okay, so this was a fairly early one, and people got some heart from that and did a whole bunch of other ones. And you can look that there's, you can select the kind of reaction you can do. Um, if you do substitutions, elimination type reactions, you're obviously going to waste stuff. Coral resolution is, you're only going to get 50% of the material back because you're chucking half the other in atom away. Stoichiometric reagents aren't very good. Catalytic reagents are very, uh, reactions are very good, and addition and rearrangement reactions and isomeration are very good. So that gives you an idea of which kind of chemistry you'd be looking at doing. Okay. And also, the, again, going back to the kind of manufacturing, 3D printing. It's uh, up to recently, it was like a toy, and that's what they were, were making. But basically, in 3D printing, you take anything you build, all the atoms are used in it. So instead of taking something and chopping bits off, you actually build it up from the bottom. So this is um, bottom-up manufacturing. And it started to be used in a lot of processes now. And this is something that's quite interesting. Uh, this is a satellite. Uh, I think this one may have been built in, in New Zealand. Um, anyway, so the original, they had brackets on it and they had to cut down the mass. 
and what they did is they used computer design and 3D printing and they made a bracket a fraction of the weight and this is now being used in, in that and the beauty of this is not, not only can you make it smaller but you can change the molecular composition along the entire thing so you can have what you can start off with one metal or uh, alloy at one end and by the other end where you may need it to have high temperature control uh, resistance whatever it can be completely different because you boot it up layer by layer so this is this is a brilliant technology which i'm sure will be used a lot more in the future catalysis and i think this is probably the most important out of all of them uh, catalysis um, and I, I can see we've got people in the audience who've been working on catalysis. Um, basically, this is the, the, the core thing for industry. Um, in each case, catalysis gives a whole bunch of different benefits. Uh, as you know, it, it reduces the amount of energy required to do a reaction. So lower temperatures required, which is an energy saving which then you save on your carbon tax then. Uh, faster reaction rates, you can put in smaller vessels, less waste chemicals and stoichiometric reactions, you've saved there. Um, asymmetric and, uh, catalysis, you can make one enantiomer versus the other if you need to. Uh, you can reduce the number of reaction steps. And now 90% of industrial processes require catalysis. So if you don't have catalysis in your process, you're probably missing something. Okay, so here were some, uh, some examples. Jones reagents is an oxidative reaction, and in this process, you, or this reaction, atom economy 42%. They changed over to a rhenium zeolite uh, reaction uh, to make the same compound and with, with high yield, very high selectivity, we've doubled the atom economy. So now instead of 40% of the atoms going into the product, Almost 90% of the atoms are going to the product now. That's what you want. Okay, and as I mentioned, uh, this can reduce the number of steps. I'll mention uh, something in the next uh, lecture on one of the processes that was done by Dr. Steenkamp, but this is, this is one using a uh, Hoffman-LaRoche process. Uh, they took eight steps, uh, an eight-step process to make this uh, compound with an 8% yield. So that means you were th they were throwing away 92% of, of the chemicals. They put in uh, a catalyst and they managed to push it up to 65% yield, which is a, a massive improvement. Okay, and although they had to recycle a lot of the material, this, this step has got 100% atom efficiency. Okay, so it's quite possible. Okay, this is an area that I'm particularly interested in, is biocatalysis. Um, it's a particular subset of catalysis where we use proteins, which may or may not have metals associated with them. And the point of it is it's very selective. Um, we can use these enzymes to, to convert a single enantiomer of a compound and not the other one. So the resolution. Um, the other bit is you can convert uh, one group on a, on a molecule and not the other one. So in this case, uh, they used to use strong acids to convert um, nitriles to amides and acids. And if you use that here, it would knock off this ester group. You don't want that. But an enzyme is very selective because of its shape. It can uh, attach into one area and only do a specific reaction. And this is something we did in our, our labs recently, which was very nice. You can see there's two uh, nitrile groups here and the enzyme was able to convert the one and not the other one. Okay, and that gives you the selectivity you need to do a whole bunch of processes and number of reactions without having to worry about uh, attaching other groups or modifying it or protecting it. Uh, and these have got enormously high uh, selectivities. Okay, and this was something else we did uh, a few years ago, a three-step reaction involving two supposedly fairly delicate enzymes, and we managed to do a, uh, a process which knocked three steps out of, out, of a reaction, out of a process. So they're a lot tougher than people think. All right, how much time have I got left? Okay, all right. So after catalysis, the, the other one is reduced derivatives. Um, so, in a lot of cases, in, in um, especially things like pharmaceuticals, you have to uh, protect certain groups and then re remove them. 
uh, to stop those groups being converted by the reaction that you're doing. Um, there's two, a number of ways of doing that. We've just mentioned the catalysis, and that's one way to do it. Another one is there's a set of reactions that have been developed over the years which don't require any, um, any protecting groups, and those are becoming more common. So there's Cope reagent here, uh, Manic, um, Benigili, and Uji. So that's one of the ones we're doing in our labs at the moment. So these will be becoming more and more prevalent and will replace some of the existing uh, reactions. There's also things like click chemistry and that kind of thing. Okay, real time analysis, and this is quite important. Um, if you're running a process, um, if the reaction goes too far or stops too early and things like that, you often don't know what's happening. Um, so if you can get analysis on the spot, it helps you to reduce waste. Um, and so the time delay between sampling and obtaining analytical results is, is very important. And you want to go, instead of offline, which is, which is you take a sample, you take it to the lab, they come back and tell you what it is in about a day's time. Um, and then there's at line where you have a detection system near the reactor and it'll give you results in an hour or so. Uh, the best thing is to have it uh, online, or in fact in line, where you've got a detection system and maybe a pipe coming out of the reactor which feeds back into the reactor, and you can measure what's happening in real time. And this will allow you to get really sophisticated and delicate understanding of what's happening in your reaction, and will, will massively improve your reduction in waste. Okay, Sulfur, safer solvents and auxiliaries. Um, so a lot of the, the problems with our reactions are not due to the actual reaction we're doing, but it's due to all the other things we have to put in there. And one of the big problems I mentioned earlier was with solvents. Um, it's not just the volume of solvent, but it's the solvent itself. Um, so a lot of the major companies have decided that they're going to shift away from using a lot of the traditional solvents. Um, so in the past, things like benzene would be used. Um, or chloroform, those are being eliminated. They can't be used in industry anymore, and if you, uh, more and more, if you want to put in a process that involves those, it'll be rejected. And it may be that even if you're selling the sun, something overseas, they will reject it because it's, it's got um, involved some of these, these solvents. Okay, so what the chemists have had to do is to say, how do we replace these with something similar? Um, and so they've, uh, a lot of the ones which are better, there's a lot of the alcohols, uh, toluene, xylene, uh, heptane's quite a bit better. Uh, but you can go even better than that, water, butanol, um, and propyl acetate, all the acetates. Uh, so this is your first choice. So if you can, you design your, your reactions, your process involving these solvents right at the beginning. Uh, they don't always give the best yields, but one of the things that you must consider is if you can get all of your steps to work in the same solvent at slightly lower yields than you would normally do, you don't have to do the work up in between, which saves your losses on recovery. So there can be great advantages in using these solvents instead. Okay. Um, and then there's recovery. So this is, this is an example of some of what people have been doing. Um, this is a paint plant that's been uh, set up in the UK. And basically, they've swapped over most of the solvents. And what they have, do, they have got there, they've managed to recover 90% of it. So they've redesigned their factories, and they build this one from scratch. Um, and they put in biomass heating, solar power as well, and captured rainwater to run the thing. And basically, this has got almost no, no footprint anymore. Okay. Uh, energy requirements. So we've just been seeing that, uh, apart from the the use of uh, chemicals, energy. If you can cut down your energy, you're going to make huge savings. Energy costs are going up, and there's CO2 produced according uh, because of our energy production. This is another way of reducing it. Okay. So apart from apart from heating, industry uses up. Most of, most of the energy, or the largest part of the pie. Okay, now uh, what the industry, the chemical industry has been able to do is, is been able to reduce 
um, the amount of energy required for various processes, largely to do with catalysis and using, say, solvent-free reactions where you don't have to heat up lots of solvent. Um, also, people have shifted over to new kinds of heating. Microwave reactors have become uh, more popular. Uh, photo reactors have, have uh, started to take off as well. Okay. Uh, this is for more recent results from the EU. They've been analyzing it. They've, they've increased their chemical production and they've reduced their energy input at the same time. That's, that's the industry as a whole in Europe. Um, and because of that, also, they've managed to reduce their carbon emissions by 61% in that period. And then the last bit really is to talk about sustainability. Um, and the one thing we're going to talk about is renewable feedstocks, and this is quite important. Um, this company is DSM DuPont. They've been developing uh, enzyme-based cellulose fuel technologies, and they've set up a number of factories uh, um, in the US. Just an example, they're producing about uh, up to 20, uh, 20 to 30 million gallons of, of ethanol per year. And they're then pairing up with other companies to then turn those products into other products. So it's becoming the basis of an entire chemical industry to replace the refineries, because we can't depend on, um, uh, on basically the, um, the crude oil and the coal. What we've been doing is we've been taking about a billion years worth of sequestered CO2 and pumping it up into the atmosphere in a couple of decades. It's not sustainable. So having broken up cellulose biomass, you can then convert it to a whole range of compounds. Um, so it's your sugars, your hexoses, um, hydroxymethyl um, furfural is what you can produce is one of those compounds. And then if you can get that, you can then convert it to a whole bunch of other compounds which can be used in various parts of uh, synthesis. Uh, for instance, kind of... Um, caprolactones, caprolactams, those can go through to things like nylon manufacture, etc. Um, so all of these are very, very useful compounds. And this is some of the stuff that's been happening recently. Uh, Coca-Cola, they decided they wanted to, to improve uh, the greenness of their product. So they started taking um, sugars and they converted it to ethylene glycol. Uh, so ethylene glycol is a component of the, of the plastic, and so a fair percentage now was now considered to be green. And well, they've, they've not got any water bottles here, but usually in a lecture I can point out that most, a lot of people have got this symbol on the bottle. It shows that it's, it's partially green. Uh, then they decided to, they wanted to go further, and they realized that they could make the terephthalic acid uh, also using sugars, and so both components to make PET can now be used, uh, can now be made uh, from renewable resources. Um, there's another company uh, which has replaced the terephthalic acid with uh, furan 225 dicoxidic acid, and that's also um, reduced energy usage dramatically, and they've also uh, managed to improve the properties of the bottle by using the slightly different compound. Okay, so we're now moving beyond just trying to re uh, replace the chemicals that are uh, possible through the refinery industry, but actually coming up with new ones. And I don't know if the carpet here is made of it, but uh, DuPont went along to make, uh, also to take the um, terephthalate. They make propane 1,3-diol using fermentation uh, to match that up. They put it together and they make the fibers for carpets. So now a large, a large percentage of carpets around the world of this very durable material is made using uh, renewable compounds uh, through fermentation and uh, chemical modification. Okay, and the last one I think is the design for degradation. Um, we see in the circular economy you've got to reuse everything. So we need to get stuff that can be broken apart, either by ourselves and then reincorporated into other things, or we've got to make it so it can be destroyed by the microbes in nature. 
Okay, so this is the garbage patch. I don't know if, uh, I know on Sky News they've been showing a lot of this kind of thing about turtles and the microplastics, but this is uh, somebody rowing through one of these patches in the oceans where it, because of the uh, circulation of the oceans it accumulates in large quantities. And most of this then through um, sort of uh, photocatalysis, I suppose, and attrition, breaks into smaller and smaller components which then fall down to the seabed. Um, and are taken up often by life forms down there. Okay, so that needs to be stopped. And so, again, we can shift over to using things like polylactic, uh, polylactic acid. And that gives us a plastic which, because it's got these ester bonds, is easily broken down by microbes once it's been, once it's been broken down into smaller components. And that makes it part of the, uh, part of the global em environment and is no longer a threat to us. Okay, but the, the natural products are still quite, quite stable. So I think that's given you, sorry, a whirlwind tour of green chemistry. Um, but just as I like to say, go back to the original slide, we're here, it's a, basically we're on a spaceship. Uh, and we've got a life support system and we can't foul it up. So we need to apply as many green, principles, green chemistry principles as possible. Thank you very much.